Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. You may be seated. See, the desire of our hearts as a church is to experience God move. So take that word to heart this morning. Say, Father, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. When we get together, we want to see the gifts of the Spirit move. Thank you, brother, for sharing that. Thank you for stepping out boldly. We receive that in Jesus' name. See, he touched on a very important uh, area in that word of encouragement, that prophecy. It says, and suddenly, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, righty, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were seated. And then we know the story of what happened. It said, like, fire, like cloven tongues, sat on each individual, and they were what? Suddenly, instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. See, God is a God of the suddenlies. Suddenly, when you least expect it, he will show up. He will show up when you're on your sick bed. He will show up when you've been praying for that wayward son or daughter. God is a God of the suddenlies. And we need him in our midst. It said, in, uh, if you read the story and it continues, in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were meeting together was shaken as a sign of God's presence. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness and courage. This was another event after the day of Pentecost. It wasn't just a one-time experience. It wasn't just a one-time occurrence. You may say, oh, but brother, I've been filled in 1957. God filled me with his Holy Spirit. Well, how far do you get on one tank of gas these days? Not very far, amen? I'm not trying to uh, talk down to the fact that God filled you in 1957 or 67 or 77 or 87, whatever year it was, but we need a new infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, amen? amen. We need God to show, come on. We need God to fill us again and again and again because as he does, he empowers us to do the work of the kingdom, to go out there and reach the lost. On the day of Pentecost, there were many that were listening and they said, how can it be that they're speaking my own language? It was a proof to the unchurched that God was in their midst, that God was doing something. God was doing a supernatural thing. We quite often live in the natural realm, but God moves in the supernatural realm. I haven't even got to my message. This is just, <laughs> I don't know why this happens. Every time I get up to speak, uh, I, God leads me down another path because I, I have something on my heart, and I don't know if I'll get to my message. I have a good message to share this morning, but let's just camp here for a while about the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. <laughs> See, so great was the need of the disciples for the power to become witnesses that they were not to leave Jerusalem until they had it. What, did they, what, they, what were they expecting? Do not leave Jerusalem until you have been endued with power from on high. Power. Power in your life. Power to be a witness. Power to walk straight. Power to defeat the enemy. Power to come against the evil one. Power. That word power is dunamis. It speaks of the miracle realm. See, we're living in a day and age where God's going to be doing some powerful miracles. I'm waiting for the day when someone comes and they only have, uh, maybe they're missing their leg from the knee down. I believe in a supernatural God. I believe in a God that will do supernatural things. Wouldn't it be awesome if you have an individual come to the church, they come up for prayer, or sitting there in the audience while we're preaching and while we're teaching. It says, Apostle Paul said, it's not in the excellence of teaching and preaching, but in the demonstration of what? Power. The demonstration of power. That that leg would grow out right before our very eyes. 
or a blind eyes would be opened, just like on the, in the days of uh, Jesus. See, the interesting thing is that the disciples, they had spent a, a number of years with Jesus. The word power, dunamis, speaks of the miracle realm. It comes from dunamai, which means the ability. Think about it. We get to be clothed with God's ability. How many could use some of God's ability in your life right now? Amen. Amen. I see a lot of hands going up. See, the remaining 11 disciples were already the most trained people in the world in signs and wonders. I shared this on Thursday night at the uh, worship invasion. And I think it's timely this morning that I share it again. See, the disciples were already the most trained people in signs and wonders in all of history. They had watched Jesus do miracles. They had watched Jesus walk on water. They had watched uh, uh, him calm the storm. They had watched him uh, heal the leper and the blind eye opened and the demoniac set free. They had seen all these things. And yet, it was those 11 who had to stay until they were clothed with power from on high. And when they got it, they knew it. When you get the power of the Holy Spirit, no one has to tell you. No one needs to explain to you that God showed up, God is in the house, God is in your life, because you know what? It's not Rundai Shundai on my way to drive my Hyundai. No, it's not like that. (laughs) See, when they got it, they knew it. And this power came through an encounter with God. Those of you that have known me for a while, what does Pastor Yarmo always say? We need an encounter with God. Maybe this morning is your time to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit so you, you, you begin to pray in new tongues. You get your heavenly language. It said, he who prays in tongues shall edify himself. That's why the Lord gave us this word right in the beginning after worship is because he wants to encourage us to get in the river. Not just standing on the edge and going, ooh, that's cold. We were at men's camp yesterday and there was a bunch of guys. We got the main sauna and then we got the little sauna. We call that 55 plus. And uh, I happen to be in the 55-plus sauna. <laughs> Everybody asks me, Pastor Yarman, what are, what's your age? What are you, 55, 57? Oh, yeah, that's a good number. We'll go with that. <laughs> Anyways, where was I going with this? Yeah, I was watching the older guys at camp. By the way, we had an awesome men's camp. Just a, just a little bit of a rabbit trail. I'll get back onto what I'm talking. I just want to thank uh, Daniel. Yari and Ken. These guys did an awesome job being the cooks. They did an awesome job uh, putting everything, putting out a nice spread so we would have a wonderful time. There's about 30 guys out there enjoying camp. So thank you, Ken, Yari, and Daniel. Let's give them a hand. Come on. Yari may be downstairs watching on live. Perhaps, Yari. Anyways, uh, I was watching these guys at camp, and uh, the, the premise of the sauna is you get in, get in there, get hot, and you sweat. But these guys, they were, I think it was Mike. I was watching Mike. Mike at the back there. He comes out of the sauna, and you can see steam rising off him. He's like, woo, ha-boom, <laughs> right into the lake. And the next thing I hear is, woo, ah, woo, woo. <laughs> He's screaming like a girl. That's all right. He jumped in. The point I'm making is we don't need to stand there and test the water and say, whoo, am I going to get in the river? When the river is here, folks, you need to just get in. You just need to get in. How many are like, I'm all in? Yeah, come on. I'm all in. As your pastor, I'm all in. See, following the anointing in the presence of God is similar to what the children of Israel did when the cloud of his presence was with them in the wilderness. And the Israelites, they didn't have any control over what God was going to do. He led them, they followed. 
What we need to do is learn to be led by the Spirit, and we follow where God is taking us. When he was, wherever he went, supernatural activities took place. Supernatural things happened. We are so sense-minded, touch, taste, feel, hear, see, that quite often we overlook that there's a whole supernatural realm behind us. Even this morning, there's angels here. We just don't see them. God's here by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is here. Father God is here. Jesus is here. The, tri the Trinity is here. Sometimes we need to ask God to open our eyes to see the supernatural realm. Because it's a, you see, God lives in the supernatural realm. We live in the natural realm. And we need to step into the realm beyond reason. The realm where sometimes we just lay aside our thinking and we step into the realm of no reason, the realm of beyond reason, where we don't try to think it out, we don't try to explain it, we don't try to analyze it, we don't make a doctrine or a theology out of it. By the way, I've said this before, God is not a theology, he's not a doctrine, he's a real person. And you need to experience him as a real person in your life. Maybe you've experienced him back in 57, whatever year that was. But let me encourage you, now is the time to get into the river again. Because we are living in some very unsettled times. And I know myself, I need the power of the Holy Spirit every day. I need the power of the Holy Spirit every week. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in decision-making. The leadership of this church, they need the power of the Holy Spirit. When we get together, even as a staff, on Wednesdays at 10.30 here in the church, we have a staff meeting. Everything we do, we want to do with excellence, but we get together as brothers, and we pray and say, God, would you give us God ideas, not just good ideas? Because God ideas will come to pass. Good ideas might come to pass. So we want to be spirit-led, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, on fire, believing Christians. Amen? Amen? I think I preached this before. I said, you don't have to announce fire when it's present. We got some firefighters in this church. We actually have a deputy fire chief that attends this church. And you don't have to tell John, hey, there's fire over there, because guess what? It's self-announcing. When the fire of the Holy Spirit is here, you don't have to say, oh, the fire is over there. It's over here. It's self-announcing. When the Holy Spirit shows up, you will know it. You will sense it. You will feel it. No one has to tell you. You will know yourself. Amen? Isaiah 55, verse 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as, high, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But God has good thoughts for you this morning. He wants to bring you to a place where you're open to him, open to the move of the Spirit, and ready to step into the river. Amen? Okay, maybe now I can get to my message. <laughs> we want the Holy Spirit to move in our midst. How many are hungry for the Holy Spirit? Come on. Yes. Before I get into my message, I just want to give a special welcome to Mr. and Mrs. Samuel. Would you folks stand up, please? These folks are all the way from India. They're visiting here this morning. They're, they're visiting here this morning. You may be seated. Uh, they have a fine son, Daniel Samuel. Daniel on camera. A lot, a lot of you know Daniel. He's a son of this house. See, the thing is, folks, if you decide to make Solemn your home, 
the church where you want to fellowship, you will be a son and a daughter of this house. We will look after you. We'll take care of you. We'll speak into your life. We'll encourage you. There's men and women in this church have, have a powerful anointing. I think I said it last Sunday. I said I got encouraged by the women's uh, Mother's Day service where we had powerful women of this church give their individual testimonies of how God moved in their lives, how sometimes they had to just trust God because they felt like they were in jail, they couldn't step out, they didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I actually used an example of one lady who really inspired me into some of the messages that I, I, I speak and preach on, and I said, I'm not going to name her name, her name starts with S, and it ends with U-E. <laughs> I think she's here this morning, but we have... Women, men and women in this house, if you come and become part of Solemn, they will surround you. They've got wisdom beyond years. We have Marion sitting over there, precious servant of God. Her husband passed away a year ago. She lives across the road, comes here, but she's been a, a pastor's wife for how many years, Marion? A long time. Well over 50, 60 years, served the Lord in different places with her husband. We have people in this house who will support you, who will get behind you, and who will encourage you and uplift you and speak into your life if you will allow them to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next Sunday, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Samuel. He's a, he's a music teacher. Uh, I'm sure he was looking over. Oh, wow, you guys got a Petrov piano here. So... <laughs> We're going to have him play next Sunday for us and, and get on the piano and just bless us with his gifting and ministry. And then I'm going to have him come up and share a few thoughts that are on his heart. So thank you for being here. They're going to be here for quite some while visiting. And so it's wonderful to see. As a matter of fact, they've been watching us online in India. Isn't that great? We, we, we've got technology that goes all around the world. Maybe you're watching online right now and you've drifted. You've kind of, your, your, your ember in your heart has gotten cold. And I give this analogy. If you've got a fire burning and all the coals and embers are together, there's a big flame. But if you take it and you come in there and you kick all the embers and they scatter all over the place, how long do you think it takes for that one ember to the fire to die down and it gets cold. Not very long. That's why the Bible says, do not forsake the fellowship of believers because God wants you to be in the midst of his people so that the fire in your heart, the fire in your life keeps burning so that you don't become an ember that's out there by itself. But you know what, folks? If you take a pair of tongs, I don't recommend taking an ember that just died out because you may burn your fingers, but if you take a pair of tongs, take that ember, put it back into the fire where there's still a little bit of flame, what happens? Ooh, that ember relights again. God wants to relight your ember this morning. He wants to re reignite you, refire you. So if even if you're watching online and you aren't in the service, come and experience God because God is in the house, amen? amen? Don't be an ember that's out there by yourself because the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he wants to do. And he wants to basically for you to beat yourself up and then when you're, he's done beating you up, he'll give you the bat and then you can beat yourself up over the head some more. That's the tactic of the enemy. Well, I better get to my message here. <laughs> the title of my message is Identity Crises. Ephesians 1, 3 through 7, you can read it for yourself. Uh, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any person is ingrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. Amen. You need to receive the, 
Sometimes we just need to put the word of God in us and receive it and dwell on it and meditate it. And at the end of the day, go, woo, I feel good. I feel good. By the way, they edited that part of the, the message because Shaw Cable broadcasts our services and they go, oh, you can't use that because Pastor Yarmo used a, uh, a song that was back in the day. Who was the guy? Uh, help me out now, guys. Who was the guy that sang that? I feel good. James Brown? Yeah, that's copyrighted apparently. I can say it, but they can't put it out there. So anyways... This morning, I want to speak to you about identity. See, the dictionary definition of identity is the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. And if I was to explain to you who you really are without, if I was to ask you to explain to me who you really are without relating yourself to your family, job, title, etc., would you be able to do it? If I took any one of you and said, tell me who you are, you probably or most likely say, well, I'm a wife because I'm married. I'm a mother because I have children. Uh, I'm a student because I go to school. Uh, I'm a policeman because that's what I do for a living. But that's not the real you. The real you is what God created you to be. Amen? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning is the real you. See, people often relate their identity to their family background, their relationships, their job. Young people often gain their identity from the latest fashions and trends and the music they listen to or popular expectations of those around them. Uh, you need to be funny to be cool or you need to be good looking to be accepted. You know, we do our hair a certain way and we spend a lot of time in front of the mirror uh, fixing our makeup. Well, I don't do that, but <laughs> when I was interviewing Katrina here the other Sunday when God really moved on her, she says, oh, Pastor Yarmo, don't start. I'm, I'm going to mess up my makeup. I said, don't worry. I'm going to mess up my makeup too. <laughs> but we want to look cool, right? Even the pastor wants to look cool, you know? <laughs> we... We all want to fit in, right? We all want to fit in, look like the latest style and fashion. And My wife's in the back going, oh, man. What did I get myself into when I married this guy? <laughs> but quite often what we do is we, we relate ourselves to our outer person, the person that we think we are. You know, our identity by the way we dress, the way we act. Uh, so are you able to explain to others who the real you is? See, there's a lot of people out there trying to discover their identity. You go downtown and take a drive, and very quickly you'll see that uh, there's some people that are struggling with their identity. Uh, you may see the cool guy with the fast car and the fancy clothes and the hot-looking girl next to him portraying the image that he's got it all together, right? But that's not the real you. This morning, I just want to give you a teaching on the real you. There's people everywhere who are in an identity crisis. This is a very vast subject. I don't want to go down that road from what the secular view of identity is and so forth. I want to tell you what God says about you as an individual, what your identity in Christ is. Researchers have found that those who have made a strong commitment to identity tend to be happier and healthier than those who have not. The ones that have identity confusion, believers in their lives, feel out of place in the world and don't pursue a sense of identity. They feel like they don't fit in or belong uh, no wonder the Apostle Paul emphasized and wrote so many times in the Scripture about who we are in Christ. See, back then, even people were, in Jesus' time, they were struggling with their identity. They were just struggling with, who am I? Where do I fit in? And as I was thinking about this message, I began to realize that many of the problems that we face today, even as believers, revolves around 
our identity in Christ. Many believers aren't growing and experiencing the fruit in their lives that they should because somehow they've lost or never realized their true identity in Christ. Understanding your identity in Christ is absolutely essential to your success at living the victorious Christian life. The reason I know this is because I was one of those individuals. When I was younger, I struggled with knowing who I was in Christ. I didn't feel like, even though I had committed my life to the Lord and and was attending a church on a regular basis, quite often I didn't feel forgiven. or Quite often I felt like I didn't measure up or quite often I didn't feel adequate enough. And I was bound by legalism. I was bound and I was struggling and and I'd have good days and bad days. And you go, yeah, but you're a pastor. Well, I wasn't a pastor back then. I was learning to be a pastor. I was learning the things of God. And I was a youth pastor and an associate pastor like Yarko. But even during that time, I would struggle at times. Is it okay to be vulnerable as a pastor in front of the church? And I would struggle. And I would think, well, how does this thing all work out? And then one day... God was able to help me with that and deal with that. And my distorted view of myself led to even wrong behavior, which led to struggling in my relationship and walk with him. But once I discovered my true identity of what God says about me, things began to change. See, maybe the reason that you're struggling with some things in your life, some hang-ups, some problems, some relationship issues, whatever they are, is because you're having an identity crisis. And you need to find out who you really are in Christ so that you can be free. For whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. Amen? In order for you to find yourself and your true identity, you need to open the book which is the Bible. And when you open the book, you will find yourself. You will find your identity. You will naturally find where you belong and where you're heading. See, too many believers today live under stress, strain, and imprisonment, not knowing and understanding their identity in the Lord. And they don't find their proper or correct identity in Christ uh, because the enemy feeds them a lie. John 8, 14 says, The devil is a liar. There is no truth in him. People will quite often tell you more about what the devil's doing than what God is doing. They'll come up and say, oh, Pastor Yarmo, you don't know, but I've been through such a struggle and the enemy's been attacking me. Uh, I heard a pastor once say, a sister came to him in the United States and he said, Pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. And before she even got to finish her statement, he started laughing and she got offended. She goes, why are you laughing? You don't understand what I'm going through. He said, you just said you're going through. Sometimes we get caught up in the problem and the situation. We don't realize that we're going through. We're coming out the other side. We're victorious. We've been made more than conquerors. We're going through something. We're not camping out there. We're going through. Amen? Yet more often than not, we listen to what the enemy says about us than what the Word of God says. See, maybe the enemy keeps feeding you the same lie, that you're not good enough, you're not going to succeed, that there's no point even trying anymore. But you need to realize that he's a liar. You need to find the place in the book where it says, I am the righteousness of Christ. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not below. I am free from condemnation. I am God's workmanship. Come on. Even when I say those things and you take them into your heart, isn't that liberating? Isn't that freeing? I'm the workmanship of Christ. I am free from condemnation, Romans 8, 1. See, it's all in the book. Your true identity is in the book, not what the world says about you, not what your friends say about you, not what your enemy says, and so on. It says he's the father of lies, accuser of the brethren, the sister, That's my own translation there. But he accuses us constantly and he assaults us because he doesn't want us to believe what the Lord says about us. 
He continually seeks to rob our true identity and remind us, our, remind us of our past, our shame, our guilt, all those things. But God wants to remind us of, remind us of who we really are. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. A lot of people go, oh, Pastor Yarmo, the devil's a lion and he's after me. Read it again. It says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like, like. We skip over these simple words, but, if, like. The devil is not original. He's a counterfeit. It says he goes around like a roaring lion. He's not a lion. He just pretends he's a lion. He acts like he's a lion. It's easy. He goes around like a roaring lion. He's not the real deal. He's counterfeit. He's fake. So don't fall for his trap when he comes against you because he's not the real deal. He's a counterfeit. He, does have, he has no creative power in him. He is a counterfeit. And you need to understand that. So when he bombards you, you can just say, talk to the hand. The enemy comes to you and accuses you. You go, nah, you know what? Talk to the hand. Write some scripture on there and say, here, read that. Yeah, come on. See, believers that don't realize their identity in Jesus will have a gnawing sense of guilt, guilt feelings that they have to earn their forgiveness, acceptance, or belonging through good works. And this will lead, lead to living under bondage and legalism, and you end up being robbed of your peace and joy and the knowledge that God truly loves you. Because he does. Sometimes you need to say to yourself, God loves me. Or take that kid's song, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, for he is, weak. he is great. They are weak, but he is strong. Amen? Sometimes we, we need to remind ourselves. Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You notice it said by grace. It's not by works. It's by grace. That means unmerited, undeserved. Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Repeat after me. There is now no condemnation. There is no condemnation. There's no, now no what? Condemnation. For those who are in who? Are you in Christ Jesus this morning? then there is now no what? Condemnation. Condemnation. Sometimes we learn by repetition. We just need to repeat it and repeat it until we get it. It gets down in our spirit. And then we can go around and say, you know what? I'm the righteousness of Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what? I have no condemnation in me because Christ died for me. I've been made his righteousness. See, we need to start living in the now because it says there is now, now, in this moment right now, there is now no condemnation. So we need to start living in the now, start living in the moment, this moment right now. Jesus didn't come to shame you. He came to save you. Amen? And once you know who you are, you can be begin to live because of your identity in Christ. See, we need to see ourselves as empowered, equipped, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. We gain our identity from who we are in Jesus. He sanctifies us, teaches us, comforts us with his all-sufficient grace. Not only do we enjoy all the promises of God, but we are privileged to be his ministers and representatives. See, once you've been set free, you can help other people get free. You can tell them your story. You can share what God has done for you, and you will become a testimony, like Yarko said this morning. So 
Begin to see your true identity in Christ. See, the thing is, what we really do is we hold up the word of God like a mirror to tell us the things about ourselves that we wouldn't otherwise see because uh, the most important things that we see are in the natural, but what God says is in the spiritual. So we need to look at the word of God and read the word of God, and it's like a mirror, and we see ourselves in that reflection, and we become like that reflection that we see. Amen? Amen. See, the more you reaffirm who you are in Christ, the more your behavior will begin to reflect your true identity. See, we live in a dysfunctional world. The first family that ever lived on this earth was dysfunctional, and we inherited that dysfunctionality. It came from Adam and Eve, from our original parents. But I've got good news for you. We were redeemed by the work of the cross, by Jesus, from that dysfunctionality. That should get you all excited right there. Get yourself a little running spell. (laughs) See, you were bought with a great price. The shed blood of Jesus redeemed you from dysfunctionality and sin and condemnation. There is now, therefore, no, now, no what? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, condemnation will hold you back, hold you to your past. It will hold you back, but Jesus said, I have come to set you free. We need to stop living according to our identity here on earth, which says that you're broke, busted, and disgusted. We need to start living according to the truth about ourselves. I want to give you several things that the Word of God says about you that I know is going to help you this morning. See, here's Satan's lie. You're a sinner because you sin. Sometimes you sin. God's truth is you're a saint who sometimes sins, one who is declared righteous by God. Satan's lie. You get your identity by what you have done, your failures or your mistakes, your wrong choices in life, and the list goes on. The devil wants you to believe you're a failure because of what you have done, because of your past mistakes. You notice he never talks to you about your future. He always talks to you about your past. So if you feel an accusing, you feel an accusation or condemnation, here's a key for you. If it's referring to your past, it's the enemy talking. God always talks to your future. The enemy always refers to your past. I hope this helps someone this morning. Satan's lie, you get your identity by what you have done. God's truth, you get your identity from what God has done for you. There's a big difference. You are righteous, sanctified, holy, set apart for good works, a conqueror, and one who overcomes. Satan's lie, your behavior tells you what to believe about yourself. He wants you to believe that because you acted a certain way, then that is you. That's because your identity That's your identity, and that that defines who you are. But God's truth says your belief about yourself determines your behavior. So what do you believe about yourself? See, Satan will tell you your behavior tells you who you are. But God's truth says you believe about yourself, your belief about yourself determines your behavior. So if you, even a child, if you say, you know what, Johnny, you're a good boy. He's going to act like a good boy. But if you say, oh, yeah, you know what? You're a bad kid. You messed up and whatever. Then he's going to keep messing up. But when you tell, when you start believing who you really are, then your behavior comes in line with your belief. Amen? Amen. Your belief about yourself determines your behavior. I'm a winner, I'm an overcomer, I'm victorious because of Jesus. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Jesus did not die so that you would fail. He died to redeem you from the curse of sin and death. He died to make a way for you. He paid the price so you could live victorious and be an overcomer. Satan's lie. You get your identity from what people say about you. What your parents said, your friends the school, the teachers, your spouse, the list goes on. 
But God's truth is you get your identity from what God says about you. How about believing what the word of God says about you rather than what others say about you? You see, the scripture is full of uplifting and encouraging verses. If you feel down, open up the Bible and read some of the encouraging things that are in there, what God says about you. Are you starting to see how it's important when it comes to you and your identity? See, when you're young, if you can get this right, you're gonna save yourself from a whole world of discouragement and unbelief and, and problems. And, and you know, if I would've got this right when I was younger, I would've saved a lot of years of struggle. But thank God I've got it now, right? Amen? I want to give you a few more thoughts. Look what the Word of God says about Jesus, your Lord and Savior. He's Elohim, the Lord mighty and strong. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, your provider. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, your banner. Jehovah Solomon, the Lord, your peace. Jehovah M. Kaddish, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Sit Sitkanu, the Lord, our righteousness. You see, when we trust God, we make an exchange. Our sin for his righteousness, our failure for his victory, our sickness for his healing, our lack for his provision, our weakness for his strength, our insufficiency for his all-sufficiency, our fear for his peace, and the list goes on and on. I would think you guys are all standing up shouting by now going, woo, praise God, hallelujah. Maybe I have to give you a copy of my notes after church. <laughs> you can take them home and read Pastor Yarmo's notes. See, sin was put on him when he was crucified. Everything we lack was placed on him and we get to exchange all our shortcomings with his, vic his victory on the cross. His righteousness is poured into us during our conversion. Amen? You have been made a new creation in Christ. You and I have been redeemed and forgiven. We are the recipients of God's grace. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. We become Christians through God's unearned and unmerited grace, not as a result of any effort or ability intelligent choice or active service on our part. It's a gift that we either accept or reject. Are you willing to accept the gift of God, the gift of grace this morning, to say, I am the righteousness of Christ? There is no, therefore no, no more condemnation. Philippians 1 says, 6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Oh, but Pastor Yarmo, what if I'm not going to make it? Well, then read Philippians 1.6. Oh, but Pastor Yarmo, you don't understand. I'm, I'm still struggling with stuff. Well, read Philippians 1.6. But Pastor Yarmo, you don't understand. Uh, shh. Just listen. Philippians 1.6 being confident of this, that he who began a work, good work in you will carry it on unto on, on completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, God, I've said this many times, church, God is not against you, he's for you. He has a hope and a future for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. See, do you understand the impact of that verse? God is saying to you, he wants to prosper you. He's not talking about money. Some be like, oh, whoa, God's gonna prosper me. I'm gonna have a Cadillac. <laughs> and, and I'm gonna have a nice house. And Yeah, God may bless you with that stuff, but he wants to prosper you in your spiritual life. There's a big difference. He wants you to prosper spiritually. And as you prosper spiritually, all those things will come. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. You have a bright future. Hallelujah. 
He's saying he has plans to give you hope and a future. That's good news in a dysfunctional world, isn't it? How many could use some hope this morning? How many could use some plans that include a life that is prosperous in the right way? It's okay to raise your hand. I'm not doing a test here. I'm going, oh yeah, uh, Hank raised his hand and, and, and Yarko raised his hand, but oh, uh, let's see, Daniel didn't raise his hand. That's because he's on the camera. No, no, it's okay to raise your hand and say, I could use some hope this morning. I could use some plans that include a life that is prosperous in the right sense. How many could use a, a better image of yourself, knowing who you are in Jesus? Amen? See, some of you have had some rough times in life. And in the process, you've gotten beat up by the enemy. You become discouraged and disillusioned and disheartened. And you may feel like, I'm not worthy, and, and God is upset with me, and I don't really know if he loves me or cares for me. I'm here to tell you this morning, don't believe the lie of the enemy. He goes around like what? Like a roaring lion. He's a counterfeit. Don't believe him. See, God wants to help you this morning. I want to invite the worship team back up here. He wants to heal you emotionally. He wants to touch you with his anointing because the word of God says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. If you have something in your life this morning, and you want to be set free, we open up the altars Sunday mornings because we know God moves in our midst. We come here with a level of expectation. As you heard of the word of prophecy, encouragement this morning, get in the river, for I have much more for you than you can even imagine or think. You need to heed to the call of the Spirit this morning. If you're watching online, you need to heed the call of the Spirit this morning. Maybe you need to get on your knees and just repent before God and say, God, forgive me for not trusting you. Forgive me for not believing in your word. Whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstance, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. If you're bound in your mind this morning about your identity, he wants to touch you this morning if you'll allow him. If you're bound in any other way, he wants to set you free. Will you allow him to do that this morning? Will you allow the Spirit of God to move upon your life? Are you willing to let God move on your behalf? He wants to help you more than you want to help yourself. Maybe you need healing. Maybe your heart's been broken in a relationship, or maybe you feel bound and you need prayer for freedom in an area. Whatever issue you're dealing with, come up to the altar. I said, what was the, the other Sunday? I said, if you need, feel you need to come up here, when the worship begins and the anointing rises, run, run to the altar, crawl, drag yourself there, whatever you need to do, just come, come as you are, because God wants to touch you. He wants to meet your need this morning. Were you encouraged this morning? Is there something that you can take away and say, you know what? My step is lighter. I have a skip in my step. I feel encouraged. I see my identity in Christ. See, there's enough negativity and discouragement in life. And because of that, I believe we can all use more encouragement, more love. And that's what God wants you to experience this morning. He wants to pick you up and say, son, you know what? I love you. You may say, yeah, but I've messed up. No, just let me love you. Daughter, I care for you. I love you more than you can imagine. When I prayed for Katrina two weeks ago, basically, I, first I prayed for the increase in the prophetic in her life, but I just prayed a simple prayer. I said, I said Katrina, look at me. I said, just look at me. I said, you don't realize how much God loves you. He loves you profoundly. And it was from that point that God took her into the river. Wasn't that true? Yeah. See, he wants you to have a right image of yourself. He wants you to be able to look in the mirror and say to yourself, you, my friend, are precious to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on.
Let's all stand up. Let's all worship God with abandon. If you have a need, come forward. We'll pray with you. We'll join our faith with your faith, believing for what uh, you need. And then we're going to go into a time of communion after that still. We still have our communion elements, but we don't want to rush what God's doing. If you need ministering, we're going to minister to you. And then we'll take our seats and we'll still have communion together. I love it when our Teen Challenge guys and girls are here. It, it makes church so much better, so much livelier. It's nice to see them. And you know what I've noticed about them? They're hungry. They're hungry for the move of God. You know, like I said, maybe God touched you in 1957. But isn't it time to be touched again? Isn't it time to get a new fire? Come on, come on. Isn't it time to get a new fire, a new anointing, a new, a new revelation, a new skip in your step so that you can leave today knowing that God loves you, that he cares for you, and he has a good plan for your life. Come on, worship team, take it away. Don't be in a hurry. Just flow in the giftings, flow in the spirit. And let's see what God does. Amen.